Kitco News special coverage of the Precious Metal Summit is brought to you by Nucor Gold. What are some of the most important long-term themes of the commodity space for investors to know right now when discussing this and as well as what the miners are doing with Dr. Nikki Atset bell who is a director of Coppola Advisory Corp and who's been on the board of a number of companies, which we'll discuss with you. Nikki, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for having me, David. My it's wonderful first, to be here. Yeah, my first time talking with you solo. We've had a panel with the other geologists on a little while ago, but uh, it's uh, it's my pleasure to host you alone. Now, the, uh, the, the, the main thing that investors are wondering about right now is what the metals are doing uh, that could generate uh, positive returns for investors. In other words, what are some of the metals that you think have the best investment potential uh, on a long-term cyclical basis? Uh, I'm a gold bull. I've always been a gold bull. And yeah. given that we're in this very inflationary environment, it is a hedge against inflation. Okay. So somewhat of an element of a commodity bias there. Right. I think copper, I, as, as I sit on the board of a copper company with a development asset in Chile, and as the president of that company said, is copper is a new lithium. And so we see this uh, fascination and interest in, in energy metals or the critical battery metals, such as lithium, has been one of the outperformers in a quite a distressed sector over the last three to six months. And copper, where's the new supply coming from? Big projects aren't being built. There hasn't been material number of new discoveries. Some of those discoveries are in more challenging jurisdictions or more challenging locations, as in high elevation, lack of water, lack of infrastructure. So looking forward, I think copper is a critical mineral. It's the critical mineral for industrial growth, for our sector and so for me copper is another one and then i'm involved with a company that has a pgm complex and nickel and nickel is part of that energy battery metal uh, group and i think every government in the world has highlighted copper and nickel and lithium etc that are critical minerals that they want to see investment going to to bring on security of supply i also think though looking around the metals complex globally. An argument can be made for almost any metals. We're a supply constrained industry. We have significant cyclical flows. We're in a sector at the moment, a part of the cycle at the moment that we're seeing limited capital inflow. So obviously new discoveries, capital expenditures are getting further deferred at, out in time. So we have an inelastic response of commodities to price pressure if and when that occurs going forward. Okay, I wanna spend a minute talking about the um, electric vehicle trend. Um, First of all, there's a lot of jurisdictions around the world, the UK, uh, Canada, uh, well, certain parts of Canada, certain states in the US that have mandated that uh, all new cars beyond 2035 need to be electric. In other words, they're banning the sale of petrol vehicles beyond 2030 or 2035 in some cases. Do you think this is just sort of a pie in the sky kind of uh, thing that's not gonna be enforced or is it actually gonna happen? <laughs> I think it's a pie in the sky thing, and I think it's a mature economy approach. Yes, you've seen EV build out and a very rapid EV build out in mature economies, but with electric vehicles it comes a requirement of an enormous investment in infrastructure, associated infrastructure. So those countries that are less well developed, that are poorer, they simply don't have the balance sheets to invest in that infrastructure. So I don't think there is going to be a near term material increase in EVs in, in countries in Africa, for example, and countries that have that are very large countries like Australia. Range anxiety is a is a real thing, and we've already seen uh, the governor of California, given that they've got energy issues and lack of security of supply that is asking owners of EV vehicles not to charge their cars. And so I think, yes, it, EV growth will occur, but will it occur at the pace that's been predicted? I don't think so. And I think that, the, that those challenges are somewhat political and, and greenwashing in nature when you're seeing various countries and states coming out, well, we're going to see this by 2035. I think the reality will be a lot different. Um, let's talk about some of the metals that the industry, the EV industry would affect. First of all, lithium. Um, what happened to this chart here? Why, what's this? <laughs> what was this uh, dramatic uh, one-way street uh, up from um, basically 4X in one year? Was that... That can't just be from electric vehicles. Uh, it's it's from an expectation of security of supply. Okay. 
So as we know, our sector, com the commodities and the underlying equities that are linked to those, price performance is due to true or real uh, supply demand pressures, but it's also due to perception. And so there's been this global embracing of lithium in terms of as a go-to commodity, and you've seen that respondent price. There's a lot of lithium in the world, so we might have a short-term price squeeze, right. but as projects will be built out as a response of these um, massive pricing pressures, uh, price increases, then the commodity price will start to level off. Okay. Let's talk about the PGMs now, which is something that you're involved with. Uh, there's been concern from some PGM investors that long-term uh, the, the, uh, the metals will no longer be as relevant anymore as catalytic converters get phased out, again, because of electric vehicles. Currently, I think I believe the automobile industry is the number one uh, user or demander of PGMs. Um, if this becomes obsolete as a use case, will we still need PGMs? Sure. Ironically, PGM demand for ICE vehicles for internal combustion engine has actually been increasing mm. over recent years. And that's a function of the uh, stricter emission standards that most countries around the world are putting in. So ironically, there's an increased uh, PGM loan loading per unit of production, and those emission standards are getting stricter and stricter. So you actually seen unit of production increase in demand, and in in less mature economies last year, there was a seven percent increase in ICE vehicles. So PGMs aren't going away the the way of the dodo, uh, and also there's this end member uh, potential massive impact on the demand side for PGMs, and that's in the hydrogen fuel economy. So if the hydrogen fuel economy starts to expand, and we're seeing that it is, it's no longer a dream. Uh, so you've had the Korean government invest in hydrogen fuel cells as associated with the build out of their renewables. You've had Andrew Forrest of, Andrew, uh, of Fortescue fame establishing a green hydrogen facility in Queensland in Australia. That could result in a very, very material demand uh, impact to PGMs going forward. Okay. So, but you could argue I'm somewhat biased. I am a director of a company that has a PGM asset. Well, I mean, there's no shame in having a bias. <laughs> We're only human. We are. But you, human. but you've certainly made some very good points for the PGM space. Let's talk about copper very quickly. Sure. Come back to that. I was reading this Bloomberg article, and I'll just show you the headline: Surging copper demand will com complicate the energy. Uh, clean energy boom, and basically they're projecting a 50% increase in demand by 2040. And they're also projecting that the majority of demand will come from transportation, not construction, which has historically been um, the number one uh, use case for copper. So this definitely a shifted narrative, like we talked about. Yeah, again, copper is the key industrial metal. Uh, yeah. It is a metal that You've had some exogenous risk occur around security of supply on the copper side with what's going on in Chile, and maybe that's lessened with the very material no vote against the changes in the constitution. Right. But again, copper is somewhat symptomatic of the rest of our industry. There is a paucity of new discoveries yes. and there's a paucity of material supply. So I think there's an argument that can be made by people who are a hell of a lot smarter than I am about <laughs> what will happen with the copper price over the coming years. And we're not seeing it yet. But what we tend to see is this talking upwards, like lithium, like uranium, like other commodities that spike when everybody realizes that there's a narrative for increased demand without near-term supply response. What is copper exactly used for when it comes to transportation, specifically with cars? It's, it's heavily used in batteries okay. with cars on the transportation industry. And so I know everybody's focused on you know, the exciting metals with the EV build outs, sure. which is lithium, sure. but the material impact is actually copper. I believe the increase in copper use from an ICE vehicle to uh, an electric vehicle is from 100 pounds to 400 pounds. Right. And so that's a very, very big increase in, in copper. But I also think as we look at electrification and, and, and changes in our energy mix, and if anything has good that has come out of the, the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia, maybe it's a realization uh, of the globe that energy matters and security of energy supply matters. And for those people that will fa be facing very material energy shortages in most of Europe this coming winter, when you can't turn your lights on and you can't heat your home, I think there's a very visceral re realization about security of supply of not just energy, but of key commodities. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, we're going to come back to that. It's a great point, a very important point. Uh, but going back to copper, now, on the supply side, you mentioned that there is a um, 
shortage of uh, new supply coming online, would it ever get to the point, uh, Nikki, where it becomes a problem, not just in terms of price? I mean, yeah, go price going up is one thing, but if we don't have enough copper to supply uh, the industry, if there's not enough copper to build out all the batteries, what's going to happen? Well, you can't really substitute copper for anything okay. at this point in time. You can, for example, with aluminium, but copper's particular uh, material qualities means that in terms of transfer of energy and so on, uh, means that it, it, it's relatively unique. There isn't really a substitution based on the technology that we know today. So yes, uh, what that means is those uh, those lower grade assets, those marginal assets uh, that people say will never be developed, they will be developed. Because when we look at the margin, the same across the industry, the average grade of production has declined materially over the last 10 years and the cost of bringing on new production has escalated. So the grade has declined? Yeah. So if you look at the average grade of copper production globally from 10 years ago uh -huh. to now, yeah. you've seen a decline. So what that means is that uh, already we're investing in an advancing lower grade assets. And you see that pattern replicated across almost all commodities, the same with gold, the same with, uh, with the precious metals complex. And so what that means is uh, the easy Really good deposits, uh, very high quality sticking out the ground, easy to find, the easy to, to develop ones. They've been developed, they're in production. So in many of those assets, those very large, you know, Chiquicamata in Chile and some of the very material copper producers, these are now mature assets. And mature assets normally have a decline in grade profile, which results in an increase in cost profile. Uh, for the layman who's not a geologist, um, what does a lower quality grade uh, ore mean from, a, from an industrial standpoint? Uh, can you not use that for certain applications? No, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, well, there will be metallurgical characteristics of right. different copper deposits, but copper is mostly in the form of oxide copper where you're getting copper cathode or in concentrate copper. Uh, the grade of your ore body doesn't necessarily dictate the quality of your product. Okay. The cost of producing your product goes up. Uh. Interesting. On a per, per pound of copper basis. Okay. Is that factored into the price of copper? Well, if it's the extraction incentive. If the extraction cost is higher, I presume the cost of copper. Yeah, so there is an, a very strong argument for incentive pricing of copper. And so if you look at various pundits that are doing work on this sector, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a very strong argument that can be made for $8 copper, $8 per pound copper, and $8 per pound copper in the not too distant future. Yeah. What is the uh, public sector doing about this shortage problem? I mean, you're, everybody is telling me that there's a shortage of minerals, not just copper. Silver is another metal that's, that has industrial properties. Yes. You know, presumably the government will look at these numbers and say, well, we have a bit of a problem. These are these are things that we need for the development of our economy. This might even be a national security risk if we can't source uh, these metals domestically. Right. Yeah, so I think what you've seen is is many governments come out and provide rhetoric. They're acknowledging that there's a shortage or a lack of security of supply of the critical minerals complex. However, they're not putting their money where their mouth is. Permitting new mines is still extremely difficult. The average lead time from discovery to mm. production is in excess of 15 years. Mm. Uh, so there's this, this disconnect between, yes, we need new materials and a lack of understanding that that has to come from mining. That has to come from our industry. And our industry, it's getting tougher and tougher to permit and build mines. The average person out there has no idea where their stuff comes from. They don't like mining. Everybody says, I hate mining, which is a... It's, it's a somewhat irresponsible and unintelligent thing to say because, as right. my sister very eloquently says, you can choose to be a vegan, but you can't choose not to be associated with the products of mining. So it's, it's, it's our job as an industry to, to provide those links. But interestingly enough, uh, I can think of only one country in the world, which is Brazil, where the government came out and said, we're aware of the critical supply issue. And what that government has done is they've immediately implemented a strategic minerals policy. And so what that means is they're allowing for streamlined permitting of a commodity complex that they think is strategic in nature. So that includes copper, it includes nickel, it includes PGMs, and it includes uh, iron ore, obviously. Uh, Brazil is the second largest iron ore producer in the world and the largest producer of green iron ore, a higher quality uh, iron ore that produces less CO2 uh, during the processing of the ore. So uh, yes, countries acknowledge is an issue, uh, but there's a 
a lack of realisation of how to fix it. And we've seen that in the UK with the the lack of security supply on their energy mix. Ten years ago, they could have started investing in nuclear power and they could have been uh, energy independent. And uh, politicians at the time said, we're not going to make those investment decisions because we're not going to have power come on until 2021. And here we are at 2021 with serious power supply issues. And so governments are very willing to say palatable phrases, but less willing to to, uh, facilitate a change. Is that social pressure? Because people, like you said, environmentalist groups, lobbyist groups are putting pressure against mining? Absolutely. I think at some point in time, the environmental lobby and some of these self-appointed ESG experts, now don't get me wrong, there's some very good ESG organisations, Digby is one that understands how mining works and understands how to look at mining in the context of this thing that we call ESG. But what the environmental movement has done and what a lot of the ESG elements have done is they've increased the cost of living. Mm. And all of these things sound very good about, and and it is right and proper that we should obviously behave in an environmentally responsible manner. Uh, But we also have implemented policies that have resulted in lack of security of supply of these key commodities that we've been talking about, and we can't quickly change it. So yes, we have to change the public's opinion. We have to, we have to be- Guys, stop protesting against mining. You're causing inflation. No, I'm kidding. Oh, no, uh, but that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually Stop it. true. Okay, so that is a problem. That I mean, okay. All right, let's talk about that sentiment in the space. We were talking offline about marketing, the, uh, the, the image of the space. Not a lot of young people I see here. Not a very sexy industry. How can we change that? Uh... I think there would be a very simple way to change the, uh, the, the public's view of mining, yeah. Yeah. and that is to stop mining for a month. Just stop mining, stop. And the public would have a very, very visceral re- realisation of where this stuff comes from. <laughs> Okay, it's an extreme solution. So I don't think the mining industry... That just sounds like my mother. If you don't like it, I'm just going to stop cooking the food. Go make your own food. Then you'll appreciate my cooking. Your mother sounds awesome. I'd love to meet her. Uh, I think uh, alternatively, the mining industry... the advocacy organisations are not doing a good job. I hire the best publicists in the world, engage with a younger audience, understand how 14-year-olds are communicating. It's not how 49-year-olds like myself are communicating. So I think there's some very low-hanging fruit that we can do. I mean, our industry is a wonderful industry. We need to be proud of it. We need to be not hiding and kind of hoping that people won't notice us. Yeah. We need to be a much more prominent about demonstrating what it is we do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, you chose to be a geologist. Why? <laughs> uh, my dad's a geologist. Okay. And so he pressured his three children okay. to become geologists and exceeded, right. succeeded with only two of them. So pretty good hit rate. Uh, yeah, so I became a geologist uh, uh, because I knew about the industry because of my dad. And I love the industry. I mean, it's a fantastic industry. It's an industry that's a global industry. And I've had the privilege of being paid to go around the world looking at assets and, yeah. and meeting fascinating people and seeing these incredible changes that the mining industry can make in a very positive way in developing countries, etc. Okay, let's talk about oil now. The, again, so going back to government policy and objectives, the Biden administration wants to make uh, the U.S. completely carbon free by, I believe, 2050, which is a tall order in itself. Uh, some would argue then that oil is no longer needed as a resource. Would you would you agree or disagree with that statement? I disagree with that statement. I think that we've shown with this massive spike in oil production. This is, of course, assuming it'll happen. right? Let's assume that it goes carbon free by 2050. Oil is still needed. Of course, oil is not just used in the transport industry, which is what everybody focuses in. It's used in multiple elements of our day-to-day lives. It's used in plastics. It's used in manufacturing. It's an integral part of many, many industries, not just this thing that we call oil that flows and and, uh, that supplies energy for vehicles. So I think that that shows a lack of understanding, again, about how commodities are intimately linked to our quality of life. So I think that that's a somewhat foolish statement to make. Do you think that there just on the opposite side of the opposite side of the coin, an in, a use case uh, from the industry side that will become obsolete in the next few decades. I'll give you an example. So uh, before digital photography, film photography was heavily reliant on silver. That disappeared, and that 
was kind of hard for the silver industry for a while. Uh, do you see something similar happening in the future? I'm sure that over time we'll see um, uh, changes in the commodity complex or changes in technology, but those step changes, they don't occur very often. And if we look around at the cre the, the key commodity complex, based on what we know today, there's no, nothing that can be substituted for these, these key commodities. And yeah. so uh, I would say the chances of, of, of us not needing certain elements and certain commodities, it's pretty infinitesimally small over my lifetime. Uh, who knows what's going to happen in the next 50 years after that. Um, you're, uh, let's uh, shift the conversation to your work. You're the director of a company called Bravo, Bravo Mining. Uh, I am. Tell us a little bit about that company. Uh, so the, despite the fact that we've had a very, very tough uh, uh, equity environment over the recent months, I believe Bravo and Robert Friedland's Ivanhoe Electric are the only two companies that went public in J June and July. And to date, we've outperformed uh, outperformed uh, Robert Friedland's Ivanhoe Electric, which I would say, I never thought I'd get to say that, so I'm going to say that publicly. Okay. So Bravo is a company, and what this shows, I think what Bravo shows is if you have a quality asset, with a quality management team and board that has a history of success, uh, you can raise capital even in very, very difficult environments. So we IPO'd on the TSXV, uh, raised $40 million, had a very strong balance sheet, have who's in, who in the zoo that's invested in the company. So the larger shareholders are BlackRock, Tembo, Franklin, RCF. Uh, we have a material amount of the company is owned by insiders, so very, very strong alignment. And the asset is a Brazilian asset. It's in the Carajas. It is incredibly well located in terms of economic hurdle, and it's the PGM complex. This is this is where the biases come from. I've been doing a lot of work on PGMs recently. And so it's an asset that was owned by Vale that they drilled out in the late 1990s into the early 2000s. And then it was hidden in the bowels of the company until they sold that asset to the the executive chairman and CEO of Bravo, Luis Azevedo, who's a name that's incredibly well known in Brazil, is has been seriously successful, has been involved in permitting 13 projects. I mean, yeah. we live in a, in a world where it's very difficult to permit new projects. And this is a man that's had an inordinate amount of success. He is uh, an incredible advocate for the mining industry in Brazil. And I was recently in Brazil presenting at a conference and I was the only gringo there. And they very kindly had an interpreter for me. And, and uh, we started two hours late, and so I was presenting at 9 p.m. And nowhere else in the world, I think, would the audience have stayed for someone to speak at 9 p.m. So the palpable enthusiasm of Brazilians, of Brazilian, the Brazilian mining industry for their country and what their country can do, not just for Brazil, but for the world in terms of its commodity mix. Uh, it, was, it was a privilege to be there. So great company, uh, lots of drilling where expiration, expiration upside without the expiration risk because you had a non-NI43-101 compliant resource that was defined by Vale in the early 2000s. Uh, what are explorers doing right now to fight inflation? Um, I don't know if word fight is the right word, but uh, presumably costs for uh, projects are going up. Is that an issue? Ironically, those companies that have assets in non-US domicile currency, I'd seen a very big win on the weakness of the local currency. Yes. And so, for example, yes, there's cost inflation. We're seeing that everywhere. But if we talk, talk about our costs in US dollars, the costs are quite low. So there is a win there. Maybe uh, maybe it's a win that people aren't necessarily that happy about at the moment. And so I think that when when external conditions result in tightening, what, what you start to do is you lose the fat of an organization. And so I think organizations should always be doing this. You should be lean and mean. You shouldn't have huge corporate overhead. You should be putting money in the ground. You be, should be sitting and going, every dollar that I spend today, is it going to result in, uh, in improving our return to our shareholders? And so what you're seeing in our industry is, uh, is smart deployment of capital. I think those companies that are very stretched balance sheets that didn't raise when the capital was flowing into our sector will struggle. Um, in, in the junior industry, obviously, you have to raise by continuously tapping the market. We're seeing the royalty and streaming companies paying a, a bigger and bigger impact in our sector. So Franco just did a dist, uh, royalty deal with a Canadian-based junior that was announced this morning. So they're another sort of capital that wasn't their last sector. Mm -hmm. And what needs to happen for M&A to pick back up again? Oh, companies 
larger companies should be acquiring. The best time to acquire in times like this, when equity prices are depressed, when management teams have a lot of concern, they'll be a lot more rational about transacting. But unfortunately, in our sector, very few companies acquire when they should. They tend to do M&A when everybody wants to do M&A, and so they're competing and overpaying. So if I was running a large company, I'd be looking around the universe, and I would be being very aggressive on the M&A side. At this point in time, cash is king. I don't think we will see that. We've seen the larger companies focused on low-risk M&A. We are certainly not in a bull market. So we've seen like combining with like. We've been seen, we've seen very little uh, M&A on the development side. Uh, so the, the growth engine of our business, which is the developers, they're definitely not getting the love by the sector, but that will change. It always does. And so, uh, and it's always a good leading indicator. When M&A picks up, right. it's normally from an equity valuation. So let, let, let's role play a little bit. So let's say you're a director of a large company like Newmont or Barrick and I were an investor. I'd probably ask you, okay, uh, uh, you want to do M&A right now at depressed valuations, that makes sense, but why would you not, in an environment where the world is entering a global slowdown and potentially a you know, global recession, why would you not preserve capital by just leaving your cash on the sidelines? Those companies, uh, the larger producers, because of coming out of the last downturn, they have some of the strongest balance sheets that they've ever had. They have got a huge amount of cash on the balance sheet. They have been giving a lot of cash back to their shareholders. They've become more disciplined. But at the end of the day, our, ass, our business is a depleting of the assets business. So you have to, just to maintain your production profile, you have to grow your business, let alone grow it. And so the easiest way to do that for these companies to move the needle is through M&A. And the best time to do M&A is when nobody else wants to do it. Yes, we are potentially going into a global recession, uh, but you already have depressed valuations and none of us will ever pick the top or the bottom. And so... Right. Final question. So given your... Uh outlook on the economy and given what's happening everywhere around the world, uh, which, well, you've already talked about gold, uh, which other base metals do you think will, uh, uh, how will they perform in the media intermediate term? Oh, I think copper, I think it's the, the best description ever, that copper is the new lithium. <laughs> uh, but one could argue, Nikki, that uh, with a global slowdown coming, industrial metals will all suffer. Uh, no. Yes, but demand isn't going away. Okay. Yes, slowdowns occur, but life still needs to continue to exist. And so, uh, yes, there might be a curtailment, but we are still very, very supply constrained. And so I would be bottom picking at the moment. I mean, those companies that have very sizable development assets and a balance sheet, I mean, this is an intriguing time to be exposed to those. Uranium, obviously, we're see seeing a resurgence of interest in uranium. And I think what's happened with the invasion of Ukraine is is there's this realization that the easiest way to become energy dependent with a low CO2 footprint is to build out your nuclear power base. Uh, China has historically been the, a country with, uh, with the largest amount of demand for copper. Um, now, there's, there's some trouble with the real estate market in China. Are you not concerned about a slowdown in construction from the Chinese side, which may put downward pressure on the price of copper? Yeah, I think there will probably will be near to and definite volatility in the price of copper. But I suppose I, I take a view when I make investment decisions that are medium to longer term in nature. Again, because you can never pick the bottom or the top. You have to be willing to, to hold and have it go down another 30 or 40%. But this does feel like the bottom to you. Uh, it feels pretty depressed, that's for sure. Well, people's moods here at the conference are not depressed. Maybe they're just good actors everywhere. Uh, I actually think uh, events like this, it's, it's getting, it's a bit like a school or high school reunion. I've never been to one without the bitchiness <laughs> probably. Uh, it's, it's everybody's getting together again. We haven't been together physically really for two years. And so uh, it's, and being around other people that are experiencing some of the same things that you are, that's, that's a, that actually can help you make, make you feel better. So. Okay. Well, cheers to a better sentiment and uh, thank you for uh, coming on the show, Nikki. Thank Pleasure you very much for having you. me. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lim. Kitco News special coverage of the Precious Metal Summit is brought to you by Nucor Gold.